All right, so the Ronda Rousey effect and how that translates to idealized influence and also influential leadership. So guys, when I, when I say the Ronda Rousey effect, we can really replace her name with any athlete, any uh, actor, you know, maybe a supervisor, maybe a coach, maybe an older sibling, younger sibling, you know, somebody that you as the individual look up to and idolize and want to emulate. So think about who that person is because everybody's got one. Everybody, everybody has somebody that they look up to. So think about who that is. And as I kind of get into this uh, video here and kind of dive into this topic, I want you to, to think about why you're inspired by them and what fuels you to be like them. So think about that as we get into this, guys. But the, for the purpose of this video, why I say the Ronda Rousey effect, um, there was a fight over the weekend, last weekend, on the prelims of UFC Fight Night Poirier versus Hooker. And on the prelims, it was two ladies that were making their debut coming over from uh, Shannon Knapps and Victa FC. Uh, that were strawweights Jin Yu Fry and uh, the youngest youngest female on the roster now, uh, Kay Hansen, 20-year-old Kay Hansen, making, making her debut. Now, I knew quite a bit about Jin Yu Fry prior to this uh, fight. I actually followed her career from the beginning. I interviewed her when she was making her pro debut. I want to say back in 2013, 2014. Uh, she would go on to become the Invicta FC Adam Weight Champion at 105 pounds. So she's moving up, obviously, to, to the 115 UFC Women's Strawweight Division. So I was pretty excited to hear that she was making her uh, debut on the big stage. Obviously, taking this fight on short notice. Both ladies were taking it on short notice. It was a fight that was thrown together kind of last minute. Um, but I didn't know much about Kay Hansen until I watched the backstage segment where Megan Olivi kind of talked about who this young lady was and, and you know her background. And what really caught my eye here, guys, not only the fact that she's 20 years old, again, youngest female on the roster, second overall youngest, fem uh, second overall youngest fighter for that matter, male or female, in the entire company. But what really caught my eye is when Megan said that she got into the sport, Kay Hansen got into the sport uh, from watching Ronda Rousey, TKO, Bech Kohea, back in 2016. So think about this, guys. This young lady, Kay Hansen, she was 16 years old. She's watching fights with probably her family or friends. And she sees this woman, this rock star in Ronda Rousey, um, who really kind of put women's MMA into the forefront, into the limelight. And she sees her, you know, TKO, a very, very tough opponent in, in Brazil in devastating fashion. And she watched that and she goes, man, you know what? If, if she can do it, so can I. And this is what I want to do. This is going to be, I'm, gonna, I'm going to pursue this dream and, and make this a reality. And from there, guys, she found the closest gym to her, started training in MMA, started you know, learning the striking, the wrestling, the grappling, uh, tying it all together into becoming a complete mixed martial arts fighter. And in four years, guys, and think about that, four years is not that long of a time. I mean, it's really, it's really not. She took, she was able to uh, manifest, for that matter, manifest her destiny in four years. Now she's competing on the big stage in the largest MMA organization in, in the world, in the UFC. And guys, she goes out there, and it's a pretty competitive fight for the most part. You know, you can make the argument that Xin Yu Fry was winning uh, the fight up until the end, and I would agree with you on that. But uh, Kay Hansen, man, this girl is a savage. And she finishes this fight in the most Ronda Rousey way possible with a, a late arm bar finish. Uh, submitting Jin Yu Fry with an arm bar, she gets up, she's got a, a crimson mask, she's got the blood on her face, she wipes the blood off. And man, she put the world on notice. She put the, uh, the MMA world on notice that she is for real and she's coming. And she's gonna be the next big thing, kind of similar to Macy Barber, who also, uh, had similar, you know, obviously, you know, Macy Barber kind of grew up in martial arts, but you can make the argument, I'm sure, that Ronda Rousey also uh, influenced her as well. So when I say the Ronda Rousey effect, guys, you know, it's, it's, it's a really powerful thing because here's, here's somebody, here's a, an athlete, a, an icon that was able to uh, unify an entire generation of female, of fem not only female athletes, but females in general, you know, you think about this, guys. When Ronda uh, debuted in the UFC, obviously she is the reason why there are women competing in the UFC now. 
you know, whether you love her or hate her. And I, I won't get into that. I actually interviewed Ronda years ago before she was in the UFC, and uh, she wasn't the nice. She wasn't the nicest person to interview. I'll leave it at that. But you know, again, whether you love her or or or, or hate her, you can't deny that fact. But the crazy thing is, guys. Before Ronda, you know, I was uh, I was a huge fan of women's MMA. I was one of the original, you know, writers that was really trying to push that narrative that hey, you know, you got to give women a chance. These fights are amazing. I was interviewing ladies like Tara Larosa, Julie Kedzie, uh, you know, all these these phenomenal, you know, pioneers that were really kind of scrapping for every single ounce of respect that they could get. And it was very difficult for them because this is at a time where Dana White said he will never allow women to compete in the UFC. Fast forward to Ronda Rousey. Here she comes straight out of the Olympics. Uh, she's, she's just tearing it up in strike force. Obviously has that fight with Misha Tate. Takes her arm home with her. Takes the belt home with her. And, you know, gets in Dana's ear. Gets in Dana's face. And kind of forces Dana's hand to create and launch a, a UFC women's bantamweight division. Next thing you know, she's headlining a card against Liz Carmouche. She uh, finishes that fight in the way she was always finishing fights at the time with a first round armbar finish. The rest is history, guys. Now there are four divisions, four female divisions in the UFC. Uh, it's still going strong even after Ronda has retired. And again, you can say whether you love her or hate her, and you can call her a quitter for, you know, leaving the sport after the back-to-back -back TKO losses to Holly Holm and Amanda Nunes. But, you know, that's neither here nor there, guys. What we're talking about is somebody that had idealized influence over, over, like I said, an entire generation of females. And now you're seeing these young ladies, uh, like a Macy Barber, like a Kay Hansen, that, you know, got into MMA because of Ronda Rousey, because of watching watching this, this woman go out there and at the time doing things that the masses only knew men to do, only associated, you know, being a, an icon, a, a global phenomenon in combat sports, they only associated men with that. They see Ronda do it, they say, you know what, I can do this too. That right there is idealized influence. And the cool thing about that, guys, and, you know, we'll talk about influential leadership too in this video, you know, Rhonda, and I don't, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I, I would make the assumption that Rhonda and Kay Hansen, prior to last weekend, did not ever have any kind of communication with each other. And if they did, it was not, you know, it wasn't a direct mentorship. It wasn't like a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, Rhonda really taking this girl under her wing. It was really Kay Hansen being inspired uh, by Rhonda and taking the ball from there, and, and, and you know, forging her own destiny, right? So that's kind of what we talk about. We talk about idealized influence. And again, I'll, I'll go back to the beginning of this video where I told you, think about who that person is for you or those persons are and thinking about why you idolize them, why you look up to them. And you know, in your case, it might be somebody that you do have a direct one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, that that person mentors you directly. Or it could be somebody like a Ronda Rousey or a Dwayne The Rock Johnson. In my case, I'm a big, I'm a, I'm a big fan of The Rock. You know, I get a lot of uh, idealized influence from him. I've never met The Rock. I've never had a, a conversation with The Rock. Maybe one day, but uh, <laughs> you get my point. So it's kind of cool because the leaders, the, the influential leaders in these situations, most of the time, guys, they don't even know how much of an influence, how much of an impact they have over their followers. Now, I'm sure, obviously, at this point, Rhonda knows. Rhonda knows what she means and what she's done uh, for women's MMA, for women, you know, in general, in pop culture, in, in, in athletic uh, endeavors. I'm sure she knows by now, you know, the impact that she has made, having never even met some of these girls, but she's, she's seen it, she's, she's heard about it, and, uh, you know, obviously she posted on her, I think on her Instagram, uh, congratulating Kay Hansen on the win. So obviously she knows about it, but you know, that's kind of the powerful thing about having idealized influence is you don't really know sometimes, you know, how impactful you are. So how do we maximize that, guys? How do we maximize it both from a follower perspective and also uh, if you are that idealized leader, how do you maximize, you know, the influence that you have over your followers? So to so the first point, you have somebody to look up to. You have somebody that you idolize. You want to follow in their footsteps. How do you maximize that? Guys, it's coming to the realization that your hero, your uh, idols have failed. 
they failed millions of times. They failed more times than they probably will tell you. But this is what distinguishes them from everybody else in their line of work is that they kept getting back up. They kept getting back on that hill. They kept climbing that hill, right? The wolf that's climbing the hill is always hungrier than the wolf on top of the hill. And it was that hunger and that, that relentless passion, that burning desire within them that, that fueled them to become the successful, uh, you know, sensations, phenomenons that they are, you know, but you have to kind of understand that, guys. You want to be like The Rock? The Rock had seven bucks in his pocket when he was cut from the, I believe, from the Dolphins. Uh, seven bucks in his pocket. And yeah, sure, he had a father in, in Rocky Johnson that was a uh, famous professional wrestler. But at the same time, you know, he still had to grind for everything that he had had to grind relentlessly and uh, you know ended up becoming obviously one of the hugest hugest stars in professional wrestling and then took that on and grinded even more to become probably the most famous actor in the world but you think you think if he wouldn't have gotten back up when he was broke when he was cut from the from the dolphins and you know he was he was outcasted you think if he would have given up that he he would not have been we, we wouldn't have the rock, right? We would not have that, 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 that guy, that icon. You know what I'm saying? Same for Ronda Rousey. You think Ronda Rousey, you know, and again, guys, we're not talking about her retiring after Holly Holm and Amanda Nunes. We're talking about prior to that when she was climbing through, uh, you know, grinding. Her mother was putting her through intensive judo training. And, and you think if she would have quit when she was losing some of these, these judo contests and, and you know, obviously... She was a bronze medalist in the Olympics. You think, she, you think if, if she would have said, you know what, I didn't win gold, so I'm done. No, guys, she, she kept grinding. She became this phenomenon, and she starts armbarring all these girls as she crosses over into MMA. Becomes the first, the first woman to headline a, a UFC car. Guys, that's huge. But that would never have come to fruition if she gave up. You know, if she, if she wouldn't have kept continued to climb that hill. You know, and I look at, you know, obviously now we have... The aforementioned Amanda Nunes, she is that, that icon now for women. She is a phenomenal, phenomenal role model. Uh, you can make the argument better than Ronda ever was, you know? And, and women are seeing somebody like an Amanda Nunes right now. Even men are inspired by Amanda Nunes, that idealized influence that she has. But again, guys, it's that relentless ambition, that relentless desire, and that understanding that you will fail. You will fail, but you have to continue to get back up. So that right there is how you, from a follower perspective, how you can maximize that, how you can maximize that idealized influence. Now, on the other side of it, how do you maximize it if you are that, that influential leader? You might, you might not even know it. Again, you might not even know that you are uh, that in, influential leader, that you do have idealized influence over somebody. Think about this, guys. Think about your, where you work right now. Is there somebody that kind of follows you around quite a bit, kind of follows you around like a younger sibling type of figure, and you know, you're, sit, you're sitting there thinking to yourself, man, this, this guy or this girl is just annoying. They won't leave me alone. Ask yourself this question. Why are they following you around so much? Because they look up to you. Because they want to be like you. So are you maximizing that? Or are you just kind of, you know, shushing them away and, and uh, tell, tell them to get lost? <laughs> You know, so think about that. Are you giving back? Are you mentoring them? Are you taking them under your wing? Are you teaching them things that maybe, you know, you wish you would have known when you were in their position, right? Ask yourself that question, guys. You got to really kind of think about that. And if your response to that is, well, Mitch, I don't want to give back. I'm a selfish person and I could care less. Um, that's a shame too, because you're, like I said, you're leaving leadership gains on the table when you have a mentality like that. And, you know, that selfishness, that's going to come back to bite you. It's going to come back to bite you. I, I, you know, all of, think about the person that you idolize. Think about the person that, that you want to emulate. I guarantee you they have given back in some form or capacity. They have mentored somebody in some form or capacity. So if you truly want to be like them and you are not giving back to others, then you will fail. And, and I'm not talking about just failing in the sense of what we talked about before, failing and getting back up. No, you are going to fail in the, in the, in the aspect of the, the long-term picture that you are failing to see. So think about that, guys. Think about how you are going to mold the next generation 